and welcome to the first ever episode of Ethical Exchange. The purpose of this series will be to educate viewers on the impact that the production and sales of certain products has on our environment, as well as discuss alternative methods and products to replace these necessities. I am your host, Maid Taiga, and today's topic is something that I personally adore, chocolate. First, let's dive right in to the history of chocolate. Just where did this delectable treat come from? The origin of chocolate dates back to the ancient Mayans and possibly even further to the Olmecs of southern Mexico. Now, if you're picturing the Olmecs or the Mayans sinking their teeth into a Hershey's bar, that's eh, not quite right. But chocolate has always been the subject of adoration since the beginning. It hasn't always been the sweet treat that we know and love today. Rather, chocolate was a bitter beverage. Chocolate is made of the fruit of the cacao tree, known as cacao pods, each of which contains around 40 cacao beans, more commonly known as cocoa. Cacao trees are native to Central and South America. Though it is unclear where exactly cacao originated, Smithsonian Cultural and Arts Curator Hayes Lavis claims that pottery and vessels dating back to the ancient Olmecs of 1500 BC were discovered with traces of theobromine, a stimulant compound found in chocolate and tea. It is believed that the Olmecs used cacao for ceremonial drink, though it is uncertain which part of the plant was used. From there, it is believed that the Olmecs' cacao knowledge was passed on to the Mayans, who often combined chocolate with chili peppers, honey, or water, and consumed it with every meal. The Mayans passed it down to the Aztecs, who believed that the cacao bean was given to them by the gods, and that it was more valuable than gold. Chocolate made its way to Spain, where it was nationally adored by the late 1500s, and then spread to Europe. But Europeans were not satisfied with the traditional servings of chocolate, believing it was too bitter, and they started to add things like cane sugar, cinnamon, and other spices. A Spanish ship brought chocolate to Florida in 1641, and it is believed that the first American chocolate house was opened in Boston in 1682. By 1773, cocoa beans were a major American colony import, and chocolate was enjoyed by people of all classes. Now, let's go back to Europe for a moment. When chocolate first arrived there, it was a luxury that only the rich could afford. But in 1828, Dutch chemist Konrad Johannes van Houten made a discovery that would open the door to the mass production of chocolate. He was able to treat cacao beans with alkaline salts in order to create a powdered chocolate that mixed easily with water. This process became known as Dutch processing, and the chocolate produced called cacao powder or Dutch cocoa. It is also believed that Van Houten invented a cocoa press that separated cocoa butter from the roasted cacao beans in a cocoa powder making process that was inexpensive. The inventions of Dutch processing and the chocolate press helped make chocolate affordable for everyone, thus making it easier to produce in mass quantities. That all sounds pretty sweet, right? Well, as much as we all love chocolate in all of its forms, from ice cream, to sauces, to candy bars, the production of chocolate comes with a price. As stated earlier, cacao trees are native to Central and Southern America, primarily in tropical climates of Western Africa Asia, and Latin America. Chocolate is a huge industry, and as it has grown over the years, so has the demand for cheap cocoa. On average, cocoa farmers earn even less than $2 per day. Unfortunately, this demand has led some farmers to turn to low wage or slave labor, sometimes acquired by child trafficking, in order to stay competitive. In Western Africa, many children begin working young in order to help their families survive. This leads children to cocoa farms after being told that the job paid well. Some children are sold by their own families to traffickers, and still others are often abducted, taken from small, impoverished villages. Once they arrive at the farms, these children are subject to long days filled with dangerous work using tools like chainsaws, machetes, and knives, and living in poor conditions with only the cheapest food spared to nourish them, sleeping on wooden planks in small windowless buildings with no access to clean water or sanitary bathrooms, and often facing violent mistreatments from their employers. Most of these children won't see their families again for years, if they ever see them again. 10% of child laborers in Ghana and 40% in the Ivory Coast do not attend school, which violates the International Labor Organization's child labor standards. Without a proper education, there is little to no hope of these children breaking the cycle of poverty. To top it all off, sometimes these child laborers will be coerced into working with no pay. 
Unfortunately, there has been very little progress made to reduce or eradicate child labor and slavery in the cocoa industry of Western Africa. At the very least, the industry has agreed to work to eliminate what the ILO calls the worst forms of child labor. These are defined as practices that are likely to harm the health, safety, or morals of children, including the use of hazardous tools in any work that interferes with schooling. The chocolate industry has a huge impact on our environment, as cocoa farmers usually clear tropical forests to plant new cocoa trees rather than reusing the same land. Ivory Coast has lost more than 80% of its forests in the last 50 years, mainly due to cocoa production. This West African country, which is roughly the size of the state of New Mexico and the United States, produces more than a third of the world's cocoa. The crop contributes around a tenth of the nation's gross domestic product. According to Mighty Earth's Atel Higane, around 40% of Ivory Coast's cocoa crop is grown illegally in the country's national parks and 230 supposedly projected government-owned forests. Most cocoa is grown in monocultures of what is known as the full sun system, requiring the removal of all surrounding trees. In order to meet the worldwide chocolate demands, many protected areas have been completely converted into farms. This deforestation has caused the suffering of wildlife, especially forest elephants and chimpanzees. The forests of the West African Guinea forest serves as a hotspot for biodiversity, hosting over 2,250 endemic plant and 270 vertebrae species. It serves as a home to 22 species of primate and ranks second among West African countries in terms of primate diversity, but surveys of the forest conducted over the last 25 years have documented the continued decline of these primates, several of which are now classified as endangered, like the western chimpanzee, white-naped mangabe, and the rollaway monkey. The last two are among the world's most threatened primates. One monkey, Miss Waldron's red colobus, hasn't been seen since 1978 and is likely extinct. In 2017, the Cocoa and Forest Initiative was enacted. Leading cocoa companies publicly signed a joint framework for action, committing them to work with governments to eliminate deforestation for their supply chains. Ghana, the Ivory Coast, and other governments of producer countries were amongst those that signed the framework, with promises to prohibit and prevent further deforestation, respect the rights of cocoa farmers, and strengthen supply chain mapping, with the end goal of full traceability at the farm level. Participants of the Cocoa and Forest Initiative have remained diligent, publishing a progress report in November of 2018 and in March of 2019, releasing detailed action plans that spelled out the specific actions each company planned to take in 2018 to 2022. More updates came early 2020 in the form of a revised framework for action from the Ivory Coast. Between 2015 and 2018, there was an overall increase in income for cocoa farming households. In Indonesia, there was a 13% increase in cocoa income. By the end of 2018, the Cocoa and Forest Initiative supported over 18,500 households in starting new income earning activities. While this growth has increased income, it hasn't been fast enough to move all farmers out of poverty. So what can we as consumers do? Besides donating directly to deforestation funds and preservation products, you can keep an eye on what you buy. Research the products that you frequently buy and find out if these companies are helping or hurting the cause. Here are my recommendations for some amazing fair trade chocolate brands. With 28 different flavors, there's something for every chocolate lover. Endangered Species is the first chocolate company to source all of its cocoa from West Africa through fair trade, and in 2017 alone, they paid nearly $300,000 in fair trade premiums to support farmers, their families, and communities. Each flavor represents a different endangered species, kind of like how the maids and butlers of Annie Maru do. When you unwrap the bar, you can find interesting facts about each animal listed on the inside, as well as the company's mission statement. My favorite is the espresso beans and dark chocolate, not just because it's the tiger bar, I really just love espresso beans and chocolate. Theo has a business model based on the core idea that chocolate can be made in a way that allows everyone in the bean to bar process to thrive. One unique process that Theo uses is employing third parties to certify that the company itself and those that they work with are being authentic in their claims. 
This gives Theo and the consumers peace of mind that Theo is helping create better lives. Theo has opted out of the global commodity cocoa market, instead offering a reliable base price in addition to paying premium fees for better quality beans, ensuring that farmers are always offered a stable price. As a company that is fully transparent about their chocolatiering process, there is so much to love about Theo. Alter Ego is a 15-year-old business that was started in the United States by two activists who created a business model based off the idea of going full circle. Alter Ego has worked hard to ensure that every aspect of their business gives more than it takes, pioneering compostable packaging in working with their cacao partners to replant the rainforest where their beans are grown. Each chocolate bar is 100% organic, non-GMO, and contains minimally processed ingredients. As a company that promises to choose clean ingredients, invest in their farmers, regenerate the earth, and eliminate waste, Alter Ego is a sustainable and delicious choice for your next chocolate treat. There are so many other great brands of fair trade chocolate, so do your research, and I'll actually link a couple of them in the description below for you. I hope you all enjoyed the first ever episode of Ethical Exchange. Do you have any suggestions for topics that we could cover? Go ahead and leave them in the comments below. Don't forget to leave a like on this video and subscribe for more content. Bye-bye.